Welcome this evening. You're here to hear Jinx Farmer. Um, Jinx's title this evening is where we were and where we're headed. Um, Jinx was a curator and designer at Moore Farms um, a Botanical Garden and uh, currently uh, he owns and operates Lush Life Nurseries, a connoisseur nursery specializing in crinum lilies, a subtropic uh, genus of Amaryllis family. Lush Life Nurseries is a small family operated nursery uh, with his uh, partner Tom Hall, co-owner, as well as two nephews. Jinx lectures all over uh, to very diverse groups such as the Smithsonian Institute, Wave Hill Gardens, the Antique Rose Emporium, and the Allendale Ladies Afternoon Social Club. He writes articles that are regularly in Carolina Gardener and in the past in Fine Gardening and Organic Gardening, Horticulture Magazine, and American Nurseman and several other journals. Give it up for the <laughs> How's that on sound? Good? good? So since you like the Allendale Ladies Afternoon Reading Club, I'll tell you the story of that. It's huge. It's got to be huge. They invited me up because I had selected this crinum called Regina's Disco Lounge, and the Disco Lounge was in Allendale, South Carolina, which is where my family's from. So they had me had me for lunch, and it was very, you know, Demitas and all that, and <laughs> lots of wine, and the... My second cousin stood up to introduce me, and she said, I, I can't find my notes. Like, Suzanne, I've known you my whole life. <laughs> and, then she, and then she's like, oh, they are way down my pantyhose. Could you just <laughs> So I introduced myself, and I did the presentation, and afterwards, they said, we have a gift for you. And I thought it'd be a bottle of wine or something. They had sent one of the, their, the husbands down to Regina's disco lounge while I was doing the lecture, unbolted the sign <laughs> of the lounge, and drug it into this living room and gave it to me. <laughs> um, I've had a, a big change in the last two years in my life and career, and I want to tell you all about that uh, as a, sort of the first part of this, this presentation. I'd like to tell you about the garden, more farms, where I've been for 10 years. And then the second part, tell you some of the stories that I've collected and, and I guess lessons that I've learned over the past 18 months in um, researching for a book that I've been writing. And then finally, the third part, I have just 10 or 15 minutes on Prime Lilies. <laughs> so let's uh, cut the lights out. Dion, um, when I, when I was looking for graduate schools, I knew what I wanted to do was a curation program. And JC said to me, you have to go, you have to get out of the South. You need to go out West. So I went to Seattle and I fell in love. I went to the Center for Urban Horticulture. Um, I totally did not want to come back. And then Riverbanks called and that was my first job back in the South. They said, we have 70 acres and $7 million for you to spend. I was like, okay. <laughs> I love the South. <laughs> so I did that, and you know, I'm very proud of that garden. They have 900,000 visitors a year, and they it's really beautiful today. So if you haven't been in a while, it's um, matured beautifully. That was 20, I think it's 23 years ago. For the past 10 years, um, I've been at Moore Farms, and I know some of you have been there. I was hired on to Moore Farms as the only half-time gardener. It was, a, it was a little sort of azalea garden by a uh, couple of multi-billionaires oh, who wanted to do good things. They're South Carolina's biggest philanthropist. They hadn't figured out what to do with their home and garden. It's in the poorest part of the state, highest illiteracy, highest crime rate. But they, after a couple of years of gardening with them, we kind of came up with this idea that it should become an endowed public, public garden, and it is now. It's 35 acres. It um, employs about 12, five full-time horticulturalists and five to seven landscapers. It's a really cool place. 
So I was there for, for those 10 years. I eventually went full time. But just to give you a little bit of picture, this is it in the beginning. If you watch the, I don't know if I have it. Yeah, watch that little gazebo. There's that same gazebo. One of the one of the complications is that the PD, like coastal North Carolina, the PD of South Carolina is is a big flood zone. It used to be maintained for agricultural use with a canal system. So we have to deal with water a lot on this site. Um, it's completely flat. The whole garden will flood in July and then broil. That garden is now, you know, I want to say one other thing. That I, has anybody been to the College of Building Arts in Charleston? It's a, it's a school that teaches traditional building arts. It's um, founded by a guy named John Paul Hoogley, and he built this building, and he does these amazing garden structures all over the country. It's totally timber framed, all the wood came from site, on site, no screws or nails in the whole building. And he found the um, the Thatchers, he brought a couple of young Thatchers over from England and it was a really fun process to have to go through and it's like being some in a living museum. If anybody has questions, plant questions or anything, please please yell out. So that garden now has a, a fantastic staff. We have um I, I left uh, last year, 18 months ago. And we had, in, in the end of November of a year ago, we went nonprofit, so we got our official status. And I left it in great hands with these guys. That a lot of them had been at Riverbanks with me. So it continues, they're doing lots of education now. They have this very cool um, internship program. One of, the, one of the other things I wanted to say is that when I was at Clemson, my advisors, as well as JC, very honestly said, you'll never work in South Carolina in what you want to do. There was one botanical garden in the state at that time, and they were very accurate and very honest in saying that. So I'm really proud now that I got to establish in those gardens internship programs. And we have a little Facebook page. There are about 40 interns who have come to South Carolina and now gone back out, you know, taking the idea that South Carolina isn't quite as backward as it seems otherwise. So a few pictures from that garden, if you'll keep your eye on this. Um, this was a 15 gallon cypress, just a few before and afters. The construction of that building on the pond. And then look at the size of that the cypress. And a few pictures, lots of perennial borders there. Um, I, I mean, my, my love is plants. I'm much more of a plantsman than a, than a designer. I sure look for ways to incorporate crinums in everything. And after 10 years, some of the shrub borders and shrub plantings are really coming along too. I, I love this. Well, that's. Uh, what, pahoa, you know, uh, strawberry guava. So beautiful in the winter with all the, with everything else being deciduous. The, um, the palm in that picture was actually a salvage palm. We found it at an abandoned gas station and it was too big for the biggest tree that we can find, could find. So we just took a trencher, trenched around it, an irrigation trencher, and then had the local wrecker come and back up to it. And we just winced it up onto the wrecker, paid the guy $75, and we had a double trunk butium. It does, it fruits a lot. That's my sugar bear. That dog, that dog is my dog. Um, I did end up, though, and, and I think this happened, I know this happens a lot, is that I ended up doing the design work and, and not so much the plant work. So that, I got to where I was um, 
drawing a lot of swirly things and managing a lot of construction projects, which was which was fun and interesting. But I I have to I can't draw straight lines so. <laughs> And, and then, too, um, we, we also had a full-time turf guide. Turf is very important. It's like golf course turf in this garden. And another little project, um, this is a, a garden down in Charleston. This is a before picture of the garden, and I just have a few, few pictures of this project. When I was laying out this project, I was absolutely shocked at how many architects and landscape architects literally came up to the door and said, here's my, to the client, and said, here's my plan for this garden. Would you buy it? And they were all square. And this garden is in a house that has no square rooms. They're all these kind of weird, comfy <coughs> or octagonal <coughs> things. So my plan was to um, take that tile, which was on some of the porches, and to use that as a shape for the patio. So that's a yeah, that's a patio and installation. The, um, the contractor I was working with was a, a guy I'd known a long time, and he said, "I, I can't do that." And so I turned around. All his, I knew his, the guys were from Oaxaca, and I was like, "You know, I know in Oaxaca that little stonework is everywhere." I said, "Can y'all do that?" And they said, "Yeah." And it was done done in days. So that's a garden about two years into it. How many people agree that it's a pretty piece of sculpture? Yeah. Love it. Yeah? Love it. You don't like it? <laughs> I didn't, I I didn't pick it. Said it. I like it, but I didn't pick it. Um, do do you grow, y'all grow Dayoon? Can you? I didn't yeah. see it out today. This is Dayoon Edgerly, one of the most cold hardy cycads. Um, I want to tell you the story of this one. This one was owned by David Fairchild. It was imported by Fairchild, who started the U USDA, basically. And, and Fairchild Gardens is named for him. This plant is about 450 years old, and it was collected in Mexico. It had improper collection data for Fairchild Gardens, so they decided after a hurricane when it was laid over to get rid of it. It, uh, and gave it to a collector who later sold it to us. So this plant was about $15,000 for the price of the plant. But it's real. I mean, it's a museum piece, right? I mean, the history of that is, is pretty amazing. And then it took four of us. We flew down, rented backhoes, rented equipment, a 28-foot 28, 28 truck. And then by the time we had a root ball on it and the leaves wrapped up, it barely fit in a 28-foot truck. So that, um, I hope, um, we're hoping this garden will also become some sort of a public museum. This is a garden last summer. And that, y'all, you probably can't grow the shoestring acacia. It's a little, it's a little bit tender in Charleston, but in this downtown peninsula garden, it's a beautiful acacia long string-like leaves. So I had a really good time doing all of these gardens. And at some point, though, in the last couple of years, I started thinking this has gone a little too far, a little too weird. <coughs> like, nobody lives in this garden. They come once a month, and the maintenance and gardening cost on this is about $8,000 a month. <laughs> When I grew up somewhere like this. So that kind of cost, at some point, just seemed, I don't know, it just was time for me to do something else. So that is, this is where I grew up. And that's my very first crime. I got that. <laughs> and I, so we moved in 1973, and it was there growing in the lawn. I know the woman who grew up here, and she thinks her grandmother planted it in the 50s. So that crime is about 75 years old, and it's still in flower. It was in flower this week. It's a value plant. So that's the message of that picture. 
but also that this is how I grew up, and with country people who were self-taught gardeners, and I realized that they were quickly going out of my life. So I wanted to um, capture their stories. So what I started doing was writing a history of home vegetable gardening. And it's kind of morphed, the book is kind of morphed because that seemed a little too obscure for any publisher. Um, but people like Bill, not all of them self-taught. This is Dr. Bradshaw, from, who's a, um, a, Clemson, a Clemson professor. And what he, how he most impressed me was that he was an old hippie at Clemson, which was a chemical inundated culture in the 80s. And he was there starting an organic garden in the middle of the public, the botanical garden. He was there starting heirloom seed collections. So he impressed me as somebody who was operating in a kind of a hostile environment, but he made it happen. And now Clemson really values his work. People like my mother and her friend Sue, who, who taught me how to garden with plants that were all free. And I realized that gardens like this <coughs> were very hard to find. And they, they are, you know, a lot of us, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, grew up in places like this. But they just change. So I was asking these questions, like how did we go from this, calling this gardening, to calling this gardening? I'm all for marketing. I'm all for making things easy but I want people to succeed when they garden, especially new gardeners. And I don't think this leads to success. To tell people, new people will ask me all the time, um, I want to put a vegetable garden in and I have to build a raised bed. I'm like, no you don't, you just get a pack of peas. You know, $79 or 79 cents. One of the um, things that I think is really <laughs> those, are, those are dehydrated crinals, it sounds. <laughs> Three bucks a piece. But this, this is a kit for a kitchen garden. It's like $79. It had the little stepping stones and boards and all of that. Look at, look at the seed list there. You know, there's not one of us could plant all of those to buy that kit and succeed with all those plants, much less somebody who has just decided that it's time for them to start gardening. This drives me crazy because it leads them to a, a failure. So, so I started writing and interviewing people like Bennett Baxley, who was somebody who um, I had known a friend of my godfather's. Bennett lives in the same house that his parents built when they got married in 1920. He's kept it almost exactly the same to the point that he, like, you can't bring Bennett a new plant because he knows that when he gets a new plant, he's gonna maybe lose one of his old plants. So he's maintained this in a, in a very 30 style. He does change things, like this zigzag border, see that? That was the cypress rail fence that separated the house from the area that they cleaned chickens and hogs. As the fence fell, he just let it become an ivy border. He does have really cool plants, but he also has ways of gardening that I think have been, are often pushed out into, you know, in today's gardening and especially in landscapes. You know, you, if you want lots of masses of daffodils, you can't mow them. You know, you can't irrigate them all summer. I think there are lots of lessons in these kind of gardens that we, that we need today. I also realized in doing this, though, how much people like this that influenced me. This has been its little um, a sheer debilia hedge, and you can barely tell there's uh, lilies, iris, they're basically all kind of bulbs in this, inside that hedge. And this is a garden that I did, it. this is at Moore Farms. And I didn't know it when I was doing it, but it's the same thing. It's a clipped square hedge with lilies, bacoja, iris.
And one of the things that, the, let me back up here. One of, one of the things that he and I read a lot about was um, erosion. We, we realized that in, I didn't, I didn't know this, in 1920, 60% of the farmland in South Carolina was destroyed. It, not usable because erosion was so bad. We're doing it. We're doing it again. It's so weird to me that we have that lesson to look back on. And in agriculture and in horticulture, we're tilling way too much. There, there are great ways for agriculture to produce food without tilling, and that's changing. There are a lot of progressive farmers doing that. This is my farm, the fence line, and you see that drop off. <laughs> that drop off is the difference between my farm where my dad quit tilling 30 years ago and the guys next door who have never stopped tilling. Six inches. So I have all their soil. I mean, and this is not, you know, this isn't the desert. This isn't like the Midwest. This is right here where it's relatively flat, but that tilling in 30 years has reduced their, their soil level that much. Yeah, that, um, actually, what I was getting to here is that there are a whole lot of things that tilling does that we didn't know that it did a long time ago. A whole lot of things that it hurts. Has anybody read Teeming with Microbes? It's a fantastic book. It really changed the way that I garden. And a lot of what I'm talking about for the kind of gardening that, that you all do and that I do is not, I mean, I know it's not high till work, but I do think as gardeners, A, we need to know this, and B, people are ask, will ask us questions like that, because they're reading about no-till, they're reading about the Mississippi Delta filling up with mud. One of the cool things that we, we didn't know when I was in college is that the life of the soil is so incredibly complex. This is a picture from Teeming with Microbes. This is a tomato root, a nematode, and this is the hypha from a fungus wrapping itself around that nematode and catching it so that it doesn't invade that tomato root. Is that incredible? That's a kind of the kind of story that I didn't get in college because we didn't have we didn't have the equipment to photograph it then. What tilling does is chops up all of that that fungus, because fungus is kind of grows hair-like. Another, um, another benefit of those funguses is that they're the things that break down inorganic material. They're the things that break down rocks and, you know, toenails and all kind of things that are really hard to break down. And those things become nutrients for plants. In agriculture, where we till and till and till, that process gets stopped so that the nutrition in the soil, the nutrition, the fertility of the soil really kind of stops. We, we fill it back up with fertilizer, but we stop the natural system of that production. And that led me to the question of um, how, how do we go from this as fertilizer to this? For me, this was a I mean, I didn't, I didn't know this. We, my uncle was, a, my great uncle was an um, ag agent, a cotton agent, and he really pushed the introduction of synthetic fertilizer, and it was really important at the time. But the question for me was literally, if you're a farmer who's got a bunch of, a bunch of kids and a bunch of guys in the field and a bunch of equipment and a bunch of animals spreading, and some guy walks up with these little magic beans, wouldn't you kind of roll your eyes? So I wanted to find somebody who could answer that, who could tell me about the, the process of that transition. Those, I have miniature donkeys. And I'm thinking, um, you know, there are all these books on deer-resistant plants. I'm going to do a book on donkey-resistant plants. <laughs> <laughs> like a little spoof, but, but it'll be serious. They don't. They don't eat crinums. <laughs> they love more than anything needle palms. 
Yeah. Which is why you don't specialize. That would be groundbreaking material, wouldn't it? So to ask this question, I went up to Central Virginia, to Farmville, Virginia, and I met a, um, a guy who's in his late late seventies. He grew up as a tobacco farmer here, and and I knew that having gone going through the transition, he was old enough to remember the transition that he could explain this to me. But he didn't, so this is Billy Pop Fowl. And you probably know this guy, because you know at least a guy who would never buy a garden seat, right? Because <laughs> he had just been to the dump that day and look what he found. <laughs> but Billy Pop didn't get, he didn't even get my question. He didn't understand what what question I was asking because, well, I'll show you in a second why he didn't understand. This is his garden. This is his little hobby vegetable garden. So he's out there all the time. Mrs. Fouts is like, you know, laid over in the chair because she has to can everything that he does. <laughs> so he didn't understand the question because the transition wasn't as stark as I imagined. I had never seen a, a manure spreader. So y'all have some, has anybody ever worked on one or been on one? <laughs> so there are all kinds of spreaders. We were already using pelletized materials for fertilizer. Um, things from Chile, things from Germany. We had all of these things that were coming in pelletized and we already had spreaders, bag spreaders, and things like this. So when the guy walked up with the other fertilizer, it wasn't quite the, the change that I imagined. But what Billy Pop knows and is that the plants are like little mining machines. So every time you take a tomato off of that farm, you're taking some micronutrients. Most of our agriculture uses only nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizers, right? So somebody like Billy Pop uses it. He uses synthetic fertilizers, but they're including the micronutrients. So I want to be clear in what I'm saying about these. I'm not, I don't think synthetic fertilizer is a bad thing. It's just that we use it poorly. Same thing with, with herbicides. I don't think that those are bad things. It's just that we totally abuse herbicides. I met this woman in um, Indianapolis. She's gardening in a really public space where nobody lives. Everybody comes into this downtown center and then goes home at night, except the guys who live in the park. So she and a bunch of her friends have a big vegetable garden in the center of town and they garden organically, because that's what they can afford, and they only grow things that people can eat raw. So at night, the homeless guys come in, they eat the veggies, and in the morning, all the suburban like soccer moms come in and they tend the garden, and they never meet each other. I thought that was really cool. I met people um, like Nan Chase, who's in Asheville. She has a killer garden in Asheville. And then, and people like this guy who lives on a commune in Little Haiti, Miami. Will Hooker hooked up with him. Right, no surprise. <laughs> so I went down, I had big questions about permaculture, and I went down and spent three days in the middle of Miami on an acre of land where these guys live in a tree house, and they grow about 30% of their own food which I thought was pretty low. It's a, and Miami's a really cool place to live outside, right? So if you're gonna do, do permaculture, this is a nice place to do it. But I had really <laughs> serious questions. Like, how do you, you're not gonna get all those people in condos in South Beach to live like this. They can't. They don't want goats on their porch. <laughs> they don't want wheatgrass. And I love wheatgrass. I have a wheatgrass drink every day. But how do you make this palatable? And honestly, they couldn't answer me. They, they were a little offended by my questions. So 
So I had a great time there. I would love to live a little feral like that, but <laughs> as far as writing a book and talking about the history of gardening, how is this going to change things, I, I never got that answer. So they said, go see this woman. So, and I made a choice to walk like four miles so I could experience the neighborhood through this incredibly poor neighborhood. And I came to this garden. This is a, I mean, it literally went from stark and <coughs> a little bit scary to this magic, this magic green. So in a little tiny garden, in Miami Shores, just a regular suburban garden, this woman taught me and reminded me so much. This is her permaculture garden. It's got mangoes in Yeah, there's a mango there. A whole bunch of mangoes. She does incredibly intense things, like um, has three different mango trees grafted on the one, right? So again, this is Eve Rose. This is her garden. She was a postal worker. She didn't start gardening until she retired. Now she grows all of her own herbs, and she's, she's Haitian. She uses a lot of herbs. She grows all of her own teas and juices in this little suburban lot. And one of the things that she reminded me of was that um, she kept saying to me, Y'all have to quit eating tomatoes. Y'all have to quit eating those intense plants. Like, I think it took me a while to figure out, first, y'all is me, you know, the white American guy. And second, the kind of plants that she wants to promote are things like this, um, this is uh, pigweed. Pigweed, right. And, it, and it's used all over the tropics as a green. Incredibly high in proteins. It'll grow anywhere, of course, without any irrigation input. And she said, so go down to this uh, Haitian rest restaurant tonight and order Kalaloo. So, has anybody had this? Kalaloo? Mm -hmm. Heard of it. It's like collards. It's served like collards. It's served over rice and with beans. Incredibly nutritious. And it was good. Another little thing she reminded me of is um, that she underplants everything with legumes, you know, for the nitrogen fixing for her other plants. So I've started doing that and started looking for pretty legumes to use in landscapes. And we can grow the perennial peanuts, which uh, probably are a little tender here. And sensitive vine, is that, is this hardy here? Barely. Barely. So yeah. this is, we can use as a lawn substitute. It'll Incredibly aggressive, pretty, these great little flowers, um, nitrogen fixing, and you know, it's one of those plants that responds to touch, so you can walk across it and it leaves your footprints. And finally, um, y'all probably know Ryan Ganey. He, for all of his bad reputation, Ryan Ganey is a really sweet man somewhere down deep. <laughs> <laughs> He's really sweet to me. He grew up, in, like I did, very poor in South Carolina. He really changed perennial gardening. He pushed Goodness Grows to grow antique moths and asters and all of these things that in the 80s were not common in gardens and instead of looking to the north, he was looking to those old gardens for inspiration. Um, Ryan, he has a great garden which is open. You can just go through it in Atlanta. He has a little bucket. You drop five bucks in and you can just walk through his garden. It's totally unirrigated. And he and I agree with him. I, he and I both agree that irrigation generally causes a lot more problems than it solves. So I, I think his garden is a fantastic example of how, how beautiful an unirrigated garden is. And he does it. He has one helper a couple days a week. So he and he really does his garden. So I ask him about those buckets. So it's like that's such a pretty picture. Is that just set up? He said, absolutely not. We we totally use those buckets. So th those are some of my stories. What the book has morphed into from a history of vegetable gardening is 
in interviews with these old gardeners, the people who taught me, and then sort of a translation in how I use them in modern gardens. So it's not too, too different. Um, what I'm doing otherwise is a little bit of garden design and I'm really focusing on my nursery. Oops, sorry about that right transition. <laughs> So Beach Island, South Carolina is right near Augusta, Georgia. It's not on the coast, it's on the Savannah River. And that's where I am half time. This is where I grew up. This is, um, my mom has a beautiful garden there. It's a very old fashioned, very, very much a country garden. The kind of thing that I'm talking about, you know, that's hard to find these days. So her garden has become a big part of our nursery in that we have events on, in the garden and in the nursery. I love, I love that little flock. It's a lavender with the, the, yeah, it's a kind of a weird color combination, but I, I like it. I think this um, Bomeria, is anybody growing that? Is this hard? This is certainly hardy, right? Uh, yeah, that can't Congo, the Japanese leaf gold one. <coughs> this um, um this yellow the yellow leaf the false nettle probably didn't find a nivea then nivea right um what is the common name of that ramy ramy right it's a fiber plant mm -hmm. totally to, for us totally perennial I mean it'll get like five feet high mm -hmm. um I think that yellow leaf has kind of helped this combination. But I call it perennial coleus because it looks like a big coleus. It makes more sense than Ramey to me. <clears throat> so on where, where I grew up, I am um, back there with my, my partner, my business partner, and my boyfriend, Tom Hall, and my mom. The three of us live there, and our nephews are there helping. So that's, that's the business. We've taken what was my dad's vegetable garden. So if you watch these posts, and this is the same garden. So now it's all in crinums. Yeah, we have a three quarters of an acre of crinums. And we're looking for ways to make crinums kind of cool. So I'm building on the history by trying to make them fit into modern gardens. This one, yeah, you know, red. I don't know what that is. This White with a red star center. It, it looks like that. Um, a lot of the the really good red stripe ones are not particularly hardy. Yeah. This photo is from night. I think it's 1903. It's a woman in Camden, South Carolina, who grew crinums as a, as a cut flower crop for the hotels. You know, Camden was mm -hmm. one of the places that Northerners came on the railroads and came down for the winters. So um, the interesting thing though to me, and crinums are really have a history of being a men's plant. At least a recorded history, you know, maybe there was a lot of that that didn't get recorded. But uh, there is, these are actually amaryllis, but um, yeah, the, the, the bulb societies, the Louisiana um, amaryllis society, those were really men's things. And, I don't know if it's like a size thing that attracts men <laughs> or a com competition thing. You know, they're easy to put into competitions. But and they were all they were my mentors. These people, these guys from the you know the World War II generation. And they really downloaded their information to me. I realize now they were like trying to get it into somebody new, so that it would continue. So we're taking my dad's farm and doing everything differently, but trying to have it look the same. So we've gone totally organic. We've looked for ways that, um, that make crinums sure successes. They're in pots, crinums often get like this. And you know, this plant for a new gardener is intimidating, or they're gonna stick it in the ground like that and it's gonna have a year recovery. So we sell them all bare root because I think they transplant best that way. 
They also look look best, um, but we've looked for ways to make them sexy in packaging. <laughs> you know, to make we just try to make it fun when you get a package of this kind of weird looking thing. <laughs> of course, we have to break the ground. Um, we keep keep the nephews employed. We we don't till. So we've gone totally organic, no till. We do any planting by hand and shovel, and we do all of our harvesting by shovel. What is the difference between tilling and breaking the ground? I, I'm well, no tilling and over-tilling pulverizes the ground. So if you have these fungi, you're literally like chopping them up and they can't recover. And that's bad. Right, because okay. that, then you break this cycle of producing nutrients. Okay. So. I mean, we're gardeners, we have to open up the ground, right? But doing it with a shovel in a smaller ways um, doesn't, it gives, it lets those fungi and bacteria and other things recover, okay. right? It doesn't just obliterate. You don't churn it up, you just sort of break right. it. Right. Okay. It's just digging a hole. Is that where the donkeys eat? No, this is, um, so we do all, we, we mulch the entire place with Bermuda straw. So there's, we buy the, the big bales of Bermuda hay and just roll it out. And we've been doing this for years. I don't have seedling problems because I roll it out really deeply. In fact, I can, if I want to make a new area from a, from an area of pasture, I'll just roll out a really thick layer of Bermuda for a couple years and it'll kill the Bermuda under it. Now, we, I have a new problem with this. You all know the killer compost problem? Some people have heard about it. There's a, a woman at NC State, I think she's in Nashville, who's done Jeanine a lot. Janine Davis. Who? Janine Davis. Janine, Janine Davis. Davis. She's done a lot of work with this. Um, I, 10 or 12 years ago, Dow introduced a chemical that they said had a 90-day residual life in the soil. We now know that it has a seven-year residual life. <laughs> And not only that, but it transfers on the hay and it transfers in manure. So there was a huge problem that brought this to light. People were buying these bags of manure in Home Depots and places like that and killing their vegetable gardens. It's a broadleaf herbicide. You put it out over a vegetable garden. And I, I, actually, I had the problem. I had a row of peas that just were terrible. Um, so the problem for me now is that the, the old farmer who I've been buying from, who I know doesn't use that chemical, is retiring. So now I have to go interview all these farmers to find out what they put on their hay. Again, like, how did we get, this is too weird. Do we have to track poop? In, in Washington State, um, you now, if you use these chemicals, you now have to label any manure that goes off the farm as containing these chemicals. So I'm, I also use this, um, this is a South Carolina product. I don't know what the equivalent is in North Carolina, but it's a manure-free compost, and it's basically it's the waste from grocery stores composted with uh, wood chips. So that I use that alternating with Bermuda straw. And then we also do, we have a big 55-gallon compost tea brewer, so we do compost tea inoculation of the soil to um, get really high fungi and bacteria populations. We, don't, we do almost no fertilizing. Uh, this year I put out a, a turkey manure and that was, that was it. That'll be it for the summer. We do no overhead irrigation, except for things like this. <laughs> and again, that was, um, you know, that's for water conservation. We do irrigate, but we do drip irrigation, which is incredibly efficient. And we look for ways, this is what most people think of as how crinums grow, so we, we try to show people how they can grow in, in beautiful, new, smaller gardens. Let's see, that was, um, Oh, I'm supposed to say this is Claude Davis. This is one of my favorites. It's it's a once bloomer. That's one of its downfalls. But I love that it has a very erect scape, and that the foliage get is sort of low. So you get 
there needs to be a word for that, the difference between the foliage and the flower. So you can interplant this like with Salvia Henry Dulberg, and you just see the flowers kind of floating, floating there. It has a uniform color throughout the flower. And I have these, we had these as a Mother's Day special for, for 30 bucks. I have the leftovers tonight, I have them for 20 bucks. Sangria, this is actually a Chanticleer garden, but I thought this was a, a beautiful example of how to use a crinum. This is Sangria in the middle. It's not a great flower, but a pretty good foliage plant. Do deer eat crinums? Yeah. Do deer eat crinums in high pressure situations? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And not in not high pressure, they're they're not one of their favorite plants. Like deer come through our garden every night, but we have a peanut field on the back side, the one that's six inches lower. Mm -hmm. So they go directly to that. Donkeys don't eat them either. <laughs> In fact, we used to use goats for weeding. For a long time, we just let the goats in, and they would keep it all weeded down. But now we grow vegetables in between the crinum rows, so we can't do that. So another thing that, um, that we're doing to sort of make crinums more fun is, is selecting. I don't do breeding, but I do selecting. This is crinum bulbus firma. And there are lots of seed strains of this that are better than the species. This is a plant that I selected from a seed group um, about 10 years ago. It's been about 10 years in production. The cool thing about this one is it has a relatively small foliage. It opens this, in crinum world we call that green. It fades a second day to pale pink, the third day to rich pink, and then on the final days, one of the things that bugs people about crinums is like daylilies, they kind of look like big wet paper towels hanging there. <laughs> this one actually is kind of pretty in its senescence. So I have named this one, I, named, I wanted to name it for my mom whose name is Gloria. So we named it Aurora Glorialis. <laughs> She's kind of appalled. It seems that's too grand for her. <laughs> Um, and I was telling Tony earlier, we for two years we sponsored a, a graduate student, a, a student at Clemson who's been working with this in tissue culture. So we have a couple thousand tiny plants. We'll have this ready in two years. So basically, that'll come to about 14 years in the works. Wow. That's it in in its final days. And also I have um, been writing a little book because nobody wanted to publish a crinum book, understandably. I, I don't think I would buy it, and probably not many of you. So what I decided to do was to do it in little issues. So once a year, I'm doing this small booklet. It's a series of essays about crinums and profiles of how I use them. And I have that available tonight. Um, Tom does some great drawings to show differences in sizes and differences in flower habits. Like, look how dense and deep that one is. I don't have pink, I, I don't have pink trumpet. I do have some great big Cecil's tonight. And this is Cecil with my niece. One final thing is that we have been sending crinums out. I know Tony's done this, a lot of people um, in the crinum world have been sending crinums to places that are not typical crinum growers. So um, I work with a, a guy in St. Louis. I have one of the crinum bulbus firmums in a garden in Connecticut, in the, in the hills of Connecticut. Flowers every year, it sets seeds every year. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's very new information. So we also do events, and we would love for you all to do a tour or to come to some of our events. Our, our next event is a crinum cocktail party where we make tea out of crinums and add a little Jack Daniels and a little limoncello. And it's, 
the, the tea by itself is not good, but the... <laughs> <laughs> um, you can get on the, the list for those. We, they're not public events. They're by invitation only. It, it is our home, but you can get on the list, and we invite the people on our newsletter list at, at the website. And finally, this is, um, we've been promoting crinums as cut flowers, and this is Tom. We have a hotel in Columbia that uses them, with Tom drinking up the profits. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to answer questions. City, South Carolina, near Florence. Oh, yeah. You can um, get on the More Farms list at moreplants.com. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenks. <laughs>